to uh, another episode of Open Door Worship Service. We're really glad to have each and every one of you here. Amen. Uh, yeah, I think we've got a, an interesting evening uh, set for you. And one of the things that we had discussed when we were starting this service was trying to make it a little bit different uh, every time we did it. And so far, I think we've done a pretty good job of that. <laughs> Uh, tonight will be no different. Uh, and if you'll notice, I want to introduce someone to you right now. This is our band. <laughs> this is Otis, Otis Luttrell. Write that down because we'll be calling him for the next time you need a musician. <laughs> but he's going to be our music tonight. He will be by himself. And I want to let you know something about the way he does his music. There's not going to be any lyrics for y'all to have to read today. But Otis writes and plays his own music. So, but, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but what we're going to do is he said that he's very good at leading the audience in the lyrics. So I think you'll catch on real quick. Won't be hard to follow. And uh, y'all can all get on board. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun for us. Okay? Right. Uh, let's see. Secondly, uh, we have... On the agenda this evening, we have a video skit that we are going to play. So this is the debut of that video. And there's a young man that's here tonight by the name of Jacob, who is a big star in this thing. And I'm anxious for him to get his Hollywood start. He's right there in the back row. Great, Jacob. Great. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> uh, we also, and this is really important to me, but we have a video testimony from a friend of mine. Uh, we work together by the name of Aaron Riggs, and he is better known as AJ. Some of y'all have met him. Uh, it is a beautiful testimony. I think you'll get a real blessing just from hearing him talk and telling some of his story. So um, looking forward to that. And I got to tell you, I've known AJ for a number of years. And he is one of the finest human beings that I've ever come to know. So um, just super proud of him. We have that. And then we're going to do something else we've never done before, which is just play a flat-out video of Mercy Me. The name of the song is Flawless. Uh, I think y'all will really enjoy it. It's a, and there's no lyrics for you to have to sing. Just watch the video. I'm telling you, it's incredible. And last but not least... We have a guest speaker here tonight. His name is Benny Kaysen. <laughs> and he has, he has a powerful sermon, and, and it's about the grace of God. And from talking to Benny over the last several days, I recognize from talking with him that the subject of grace is a little more complicated than maybe we've been led to believe. And I hope that Benny's going to break that down in a way we can all understand. So... That's the plan. We've got a lot of work to do. Let's get this thing started. And uh, let's, start with the <laughs> let's start with the prayer, shall we? Yes. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this evening. We're so grateful. And uh, we feel so lucky to be in your house tonight. We're grateful for the people that are here tonight that have taken time out of their schedules to be here to worship you. And Lord, above all things, Above all things that we present tonight, be it skidio, <laughs> skidio, be it a video, skit, sermon, music, God, we just pray that everything would point to you and to you be the glory. Bless us this evening, Lord, as we begin. In Christ Jesus' name. Give a make room for you, so I uh. 
Okay, well, all I'm up here to do is fill in a few of the gaps in his last song. <laughs> but there aren't that many gaps. Well, good evening and welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Benny Kaysen. If there's anybody out there who doesn't know me, and I'm a longtime member here at St. John's United Methodist Church. And look, we know that there's a lot of other things you people could be doing on a Saturday night besides be here at church. But as a result of that, we are excited and humbled that you're here with us. Our prayer is that you'll come back again and invite a friend, a brother or sister, a parent, a neighbor, co-worker, complete stranger off the street. You get the idea. I know that Wayne has already officially welcomed everyone, but tonight I feel like there's a special welcome that I should read. Uh, this is something that uh, Wade Williams came across, and he asked me to read it in our Sunday school class a few weeks ago, and it has been on my heart ever since. So I will tell you, this isn't meant to be about St. John's or our pastor or our congregation, but I think it may illustrate a truth about how church is often perceived, and unfortunately maybe how church too often actually is. The pastor says they sit front and center, the gay boys. Sometimes they hold hands. And some folks have said he should address the issue. But the pastor tells me he doesn't know what to say. Then there's the man who sneaks in the back door every Sunday, fresh off the street, after the service has already started. And then he leaves before the altar call. The people sitting close by complain about how bad he smells. Beer, smoke, sweat. But the pastor tells me he doesn't know what to say. <coughs> then there's that young mother who wears dirty clothes and lets her four children eat all the donuts and drink all the watered down juice like they haven't eaten in a week. The mother just stands there and lets him. Some church staff are worried about the carpet. The elders say something must be done. But the pastor tells me he doesn't know what to say. And then there's the whore sitting right among the faithful. And everybody knows her. She comes every Sunday. She sits with a painted up face, cheap perfume, and a broken heart. <laughs> and those who sit close, well, they all treat her for what they think she is. Her name came up in the last staff meeting. Something must be done. But the pastor tells me he doesn't know what to say. The pastor, he's a good man. He's holy, just. And he wants to do the right and loving thing. He wants to look like Jesus. And he asked me if I had any thoughts at all on what he could say. I do. I tell him, start with this and say it louder than any other words. Welcome to church. Amen. This is a place of love and hope and safety and forgiveness. We will be food for the hungry and living water for the thirsty. We are so glad you're here. You are invited. You are loved. Please, come in. We've been waiting for you. You are welcome. <laughs> Say that, I told him. Say that to the called and the called out. Say that to the leaders and the greeters. To the dirty and the clean. We are all the same. We are. May we blow the dust of religion out of our souls. Amen. and choose affection instead. May our words and actions and reactions be a sanctuary for all. Amen to that. Amen. You know, during his time on earth, Jesus broke a lot of laws because he loved us. 
And I think his church is meant to be like a hospital. It should be the first place people turn when they're hurting, not the last. Church is for the broken, the lost, the ones in need of a Savior, the ones in need of God's grace, love, and forgiveness. Oh yeah, that's all of us. Amen. So look around this room. And don't think that you're better than anybody else. And don't think that you're worse than anybody else. Because the fact is, both thoughts are equally wrong. And both thoughts are equally damaging to the person who thinks them. Each and every one of us is a beloved child of God. In need of repair, for sure. And in need of God's grace. But it's through grace that we are flawless in God's eyes. Which brings me to the topic of tonight's message, God's grace. So let's start off by a show of hands. How many sinners do we have out there tonight? I'm one. Okay. Is there anybody out there who thinks they're a sinner, but they didn't want to raise their hand? Because that's all we got here, folks. A lot of sinners out there tonight. It's a great place to be a sinner right now. Yes, sir. Right here. Because, man, do I have some great news for you. And it comes from the Bible. Our scripture tonight is from the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 23 through 25. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's not really the good part. And are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement to be received by faith. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The grace of God. Honestly, I don't know what I was thinking when I chose this topic. <laughs> this is a very, very ambitious uh, topic. So I'm, I'm going to need to start with an opening prayer. Lord, I have no expectation at all that my words tonight will do justice to your grace. It is a compassion that we simply cannot comprehend. I pray that you will use my feeble words to send your message to everyone here tonight. And that you will open our hearts and souls to how much we need you and the grace you offer as a gift. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. You know, I've learned a lot about grace in preparing this message. I've learned enough to know that I will need to spend the rest of my life trying to fully understand it. I can tell you, though, that I am convinced that grace is the cornerstone of Christianity. And you can't truly really understand Christianity without at least some understanding of the grace of God. Now, I started out just trying to find a basic definition of grace. You know, I was surprised to learn that there are at least 27 different types of grace. Just to name a few, there's common grace, special grace, provenient grace, proceeding grace, justifying grace, salvation grace, sanctifying grace. So, how will you get the idea? Yeah. And I am prepared to get into each and every one of them. Yeah, that's not true. There would be nobody left. <laughs> Here is the recap of grace that I came up with in Benny language. Grace. Everybody needs it. You can't live without it. But you can't buy it. And there's no way you can earn it. It only comes by means of a gift. And when you receive it, you immediately realize how much you needed it all along. Amen. Okay, well, uh, that's, that's really all I have. <laughs> Wayne, you got anything? <laughs> Just keep going, okay. All right, uh, well, well, I did find a definition of grace that seemed to come up pretty frequently. It goes like this. Grace, in simple terms, I'll let you decide that for yourself, about the simple terms. But grace, in simple terms, is God's unmerited favor and enablement and empowerment for salvation, and enablement and empowerment for daily sanctification. So let's talk about that. So God's unmerited favor. That means 
God gives us grace even though we haven't earned it and we sure don't deserve it. To try and understand that, let's go back to the beginning because it all started in the Garden of Eden. And this is my sort of paraphrasing of uh, Romans 5, 12 through 20. Adam had free will and he chose to eat from the one tree that God told him not to. And sin entered the world. And the consequence of sin was death. So Adam and Eve were banished from the Garden of Eden, and they were now subject to death. And man's relationship with God was torn. Then Jesus came and demonstrated grace. He didn't come to judge us or condemn us. He came to forgive us and save us. Jesus came to take on all the sins of mankind, past, present, and future. And with His act of sacrifice for us, He made a relationship with God possible again. He made salvation available to all of us. John 1.29 says, Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world once and for all time. Jesus was sacrificed and died taking our sins with Him. Please understand this. Jesus rose again, but our sins did not. But here's the problem with grace from a human perspective. That unmerited favor part, that unearned gift, goes against our nature, doesn't it? I mean, we have plenty of sayings like, if it sounds too good to be true, it's not true. There's no such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> Especially those timeshare things. <laughs> and then there's the big one. And God helps those who help themselves. It's hard for us to comprehend that kind of love, that kind of forgiveness and compassion. Which is probably why the concept of grace sets Christianity apart from all other world religions which require man to somehow earn God's favor. The notion of God's love coming to us free of charge, no strings attached, seems to be every, against every instinct of humanity. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 say, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not by your own doing. It is a gift from God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Folks, we can't earn grace by enough good works or enough acts of service or by giving enough money to church or charitable causes. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with any of that. Those are all good things. In fact, we are called to do just that, to do good things, to love each other. But that's not how grace works. Grace is given by God. It's a gift. Grace is about who God is, not about who we are. You see how freeing that is, though? That the basis of God's love for you is not in you and your doing. Grace is being given what you need instead of what you deserve. Amen to that. Amen. So God makes grace available to us as a gift. But like any gift, to have meaning or benefit, the gift has to be received and accepted. Grace is not achieved. Grace is received. That's a good one. <laughs> so exactly how do we do that? How do we, how do we receive that gift? And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But first, uh, there's a testimonial from a young man, as Wayne was talking about, uh, named A.J. Riggs. As Wayne said, he's an employee of his, but he's a lot more than that. He's, he's a very good friend of Wayne's. And AJ actually asked to do this testimony. And you will hear how, like Adam in the Garden of Eden, AJ chose to turn away from God. You'll also hear how he made it back to God. The techies in the sky, can y'all make that happen? <laughs> This is how it started. Uh, back in August of 2016, uh, we were doing a family barbecue. We had a tragic accident and my wife caught on fire during the barbecue. 
Uh, me, my son, and my dad were at the store getting drinks. We went home. I got a call from the neighbor. We rushed home. And as I got there, I seen my wife on the side of the house screaming. The paramedics were outside the fence. So me and one officer walked back there, picked up my wife. And as we were walking her to the paramedics, she was just screaming and skin was falling off her legs. We got her to the paramedics. They rushed her to the hospital. From there, she was star flighted to San Antonio Military Medical Unit where she fell into a coma. Um, approximately three days. I couldn't sleep for three, four days. Every time I tried to go to sleep, I would see my wife skin falling off her legs and hear her screaming. So I started questioning my faith in God. If you're real, then why do you let my wife catch on fire? How come my wife's in a coma? Why is she not here? Why couldn't it have been me? And basically, I opened the door for the devil. Basically, he was already in, in, in the door. I turned to methamphetamine so I didn't have to go to sleep. I started smoking dope, selling dope, getting into drugs. Uh, during the process, I was getting phone calls from the hospital in San Antonio. My wife's not going to make it. Her organs are shutting down. What do you want to do? Uh, those type of questions. She was on life support, ventilator, oxygen machines. Uh, they took several skin grafts. She had first and second degree burns from the waist down. Uh, and then they called me and told me that she was dying. There was nothing else she could do. During the whole process of her in the coma, I, I lost my house. I, I didn't want to be around my kids while I was on the dope, so I took them to where they were in a safe and secure place to my wife's grandparents. Uh, the house I was buying was foreclosed. I was homeless. I was cooking drugs, selling drugs, robbing people, stealing from people, just to figure out how, how to get my next fix. And like, it just, it took a toll on me. And, it was just a selfish, selfish act, uh, but it just, the devil's always there and he's always trying to creep in and, and you just, you, you just gotta not lose your faith in God and not lose your trust because God's there too. It's just who are you going to choose to ride with? And at that time I chose to ride with the devil because if God, like I said, if God was real, then why did he let my wife catch on fire? I had to find somebody to blame, and at that time, I blamed God. And the devil had his way with me. He took advantage of me. So I lost my faith in God, and I tried to commit suicide. I put my pistol to my, in my mouth and pulled the trigger. It wouldn't shoot. I did the same thing with my rifle. It wouldn't shoot. I went outside. Both of my guns, they both fired. And at that time, that's when like a little light switch clicked. It, it wasn't my time. God had plans for me. So I started sobering up during this process. And approximately two weeks later, I got a phone call from the hospital saying that my wife had woken up. I got my kids back. I got my house back. We went and seen my wife in San Antonio. And it just... I don't know, she didn't remember me, she didn't remember my kids, she didn't remember her family, nothing. We Basically, she was like a newborn, we had to walk her through everything. Uh, and on Christmas Eve, me and my kids went to visit her for Christmas, and she got to come home on Christmas Eve. She was released from the hospital, and I've been sober. They, they told me my wife wasn't going to live, and that was... It was 2016 in August, what, seven years ago? Yeah, seven years ago last month, I've been sober off of methamphetamine. And in that seven years, I got my house back, I got my wife back, I got my kids back, I got a good job. I surrounded myself with a hell of a lot better people. From there, it, it was like, I don't know, everything came back together. I got my wife back, I got my family. We got away from the town and I'm here now. I'm alive, I'm doing better. They told us that she would never walk again, never talk again. She walks, she talks, she works, she cleans Airbnbs now. She runs her own little business. And I, I'm just glad that God brought her back to me. Yeah.
moral of the story, don't ever lose your faith in God. He's always there. He, he's always got your back. He's always with you. I don't know what else to say. So to say, why would you turn your back on him? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, did you hear what AJ said? The devil's always there. But God is too. And he said, you just have to choose which one you're going to ride. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And that's what we're talking about tonight. God freely offers us the gift of grace. And we have to decide, are we going to accept that gift and ride with God? I mean, it's free. Jesus already paid the price, so you can quit carrying around all that shame and regret, anger and fear, feelings of unworthiness. You either keep carrying that stuff or you make the choice to accept God's gift of grace. So how do we do that? How do we accept that gift? You've already heard some clues about that in the scriptures I read earlier. In Romans, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement to be received by faith. In Ephesians, for by grace you have been saved through faith. We accept grace by going through our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. 2 John 1 tells us that we will walk in the truth and the light by following the command of Jesus. He wrote, as you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. I am not writing you a new command but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. Galatians 5, 6. Paul writes, he's talking about whether people should be circumcised or uncircumcised. And Paul says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. When we accept the gift of God's grace through our faith in Jesus Christ, we have the enablement and empowerment of salvation for our sins. But you also have the enablement and empowerment, I practice saying those two words together, <laughs> of sanctification. The third part of that definition of grace that I used earlier. And don't get excited, you're not going to be a saint. Okay? <laughs> I'm sorry, but grace doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. I'll, just, I'll, I'll break it to you now just to get that monkey off your back. You'll never be perfect in this life. But the goal is to continually move toward being more Christ-like yes. due to God's grace. Amen. That can be a slow and sometimes painful process. But there are things on our side. In the book of Titus, verses 11 through 15, it says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Other versions of that use the word train. It trains us. So it's a work in progress. We're learning. We're being trained. God's indwelling grace is always active. It leads you and influences you and teaches and trains you, brings change to you and also within you. It can empower you to say no. And the more we learn to listen to that whisper from grace, the more power we have. That is the free power of grace, to be free from the things that haunt our past, whatever they may be. But it's a process. We have all sinned, and we will sin again. God knows us. He knows how we are. That is why Jesus died on the cross. That is what grace it's four. I was talking with a friend of mine the other day at the office about this topic. And he said, you know, before I believed in Christ, I did a lot of bad things. It didn't bother me. Then I became a believer. I still do some bad things sometimes, but now it bothers me. That's grace. That's the Holy Spirit. It's a process. It's like climbing Mount Everest. I read the other day there are at least four base camps that people have to stop at for several days on the way up. They stop because of physical limitations of their bodies, but they also have to 
take time to rest and acclimatize to the atmosphere as they keep moving higher and higher. Humans can't go from zero altitude to 29,000 feet overnight. It's very bad for you. In the same way, God knows our limitations. He's not looking for us to reach the summit overnight. He is looking for us to journey with Him all the way. There's one more thing that I want to talk with you about tonight, and it's what, it's what I think is the main reason that a lot of people choose not to accept the grace of God. And we have a, a what did you call it, a skidio? <laughs> a skidio, I like that. We have a skidio that I think illustrates what that is. Techie people? No one likes you. You're not loved. You are not. You are worth not forgiven. You are not. You are not, not accepted. You're useless. You are not welcome. You are not, you are not, not forgiven. You are not forgiven. You are not forgiven. He has a choice. 
And it's a choice that has to be made every single day. Is he going to ride with God? Is he going to listen to all those voices? Is there, or is he going to listen to God's voice, to God's truth? You may be sitting out there tonight thinking it's too late for you. You've been moving in a certain direction your whole life, and there is simply no hope of change at this point. And that is exactly why God's grace is so amazing. It's never too late. Grace gives us hope for the future. God and His grace will meet us right where we are and start moving us in the right direction. But sometimes this is where it gets hard to choose God's grace. Because I can feel some of you thinking that then you just don't know. You don't know the things I've done. The things I haven't done. The life I've lived. <clears throat> I've destroyed people's lives. Destroyed my own life. I haven't been the husband or the wife I should have been. I haven't been the parent I should have been. I haven't been the son or daughter I should have been. I haven't been the friend I should have been. I've stolen, lied, cheated, murdered. You're right. I don't know. You're not alone. But God does. What do you think His grace is there for? When Jesus hung up on that cross and He didn't come down. Thank you, Lord. What do you think He was up there for? It's true. God has absolute hate for the sin. But he has absolute and unconditional love for the sinner. Amen. Those of you who know me know how much I love music. Thank you, Otis. <laughs> there are certain songs that uh, they just make me feel closer to God. Or they seem like God is trying to deliver a message to me through that song. So uh, I want to read some of the words from a song by Casting Crown called Love Moved First. To me, it's an illustration of God's unconditional love for the sinner. This is the story of a runaway with no way home and no way out. I threw the best of me away. I had my chance. It's too late now. Too far gone and too ashamed to think that you would even still know my name. But love refused to let my story end this way. What kind of grace, relentless grace, would chase this rebel down? Crawl into the prisoner's cage. Take my hand and pull me out. You knew I couldn't make the change. So you became the change in me. And now I live to tell the story of the God who rescued me. You didn't wait for me to find my way to you. I couldn't cross that distance even if I wanted to. You came running after me. When anybody else would have turned and left me at my worst, your love moved first. I want to give you a, a quick example of the transformative power of, of God's grace. Sorry, I'm old school. I still like paper and notebooks. And, you know, I don't have the fancy pad, iPad things and all that. But, uh, so, in the 1700s, there was this man who was not a very good fellow. He actually captained the slave ship. He made his living by kidnapping people and selling them into slavery for profit. By any measure, he was a wicked, immoral man. But in the middle of a storm at sea, God gave him a second chance. I have no doubt it was more like a third or fourth or fifth chance. Lucky for him, God wasn't counting. By the miracle of grace, God did not leave him where he was. He plucked him from the mire and led him to transform into a gentle, godly, humble, and gracious man who became a pastor and a writer. He also had tremendous influence on William Wilberforce, a British politician who led the movement to eventually abolish slavery in England. Listen to what this man wrote later about his life. 
I am not what I ought to be, how imperfect and deficient, not what I might be, considering my privileges and opportunities, not what I wish to be. God knows my heart and knows I wish to be like Him. I am not what I once was, a child of sin and a slave to the devil. Though not all of these, I can truly say with the Apostle, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Saved by grace. And this man went on to write several sermons and wrote several books, none of which you would probably be familiar with. But he did write one hymn that you might know. And as you hear these words, think about who they came from. I was going to try to sing this a cappella, but I'm verklempt. <laughs> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
And tonight's the first time that I, I love the part about where the mud, they start covered in mud and it starts coming off a little bit at a time. And I thought, that's the process I was talking about. Yes. I never thought about that. Yes. <laughs> Wasn't that a powerful word? Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> hmm.
tell you what, uh, I don't know how about the rest of you feel, but I, I tell you what, I am so filled. Uh huh, maybe it. Yeah. I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> We, we've got some business to take care of right now. Okay? We've got one more thing that we need to do. We are an outreach minister. And uh, this is the part that many of us have been through and many of us have benefited from. And we're going to offer that again tonight. So what I'd like you to do, if you would... Is close your eyes in prayer. For those of you who are Christians who have accepted Christ, I want you to be praying for someone else who may not know Jesus. And I want you to remember a time back when you were saved and you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and how much that meant to you and pray that others may receive the same gift, the same grace, and the same love. And for you, brother or sister, that have not made that decision, I would ask you to consider it now. See this as an opportunity. And pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you I want you. Lord, I believe that you died to save me from my sins. I believe you are the Son of God and that you paid for my sins by your blood on the cross. And Lord, you said that if any man cometh to me, I will not cast him aside. And he will not cast you aside. Now with eyes closed, in prayer, if you will come, this, we will receive you because we have been received. Yeah. Take this moment, this time, this hour to make that decision to surrender yourself to Christ. And know that He will be with you for the remainder of your life and He will never leave. Amen. This can be the most pivotal point in your life. And the difference is staggering for those of us who have been there and experienced that and experienced the walk with God through this life. Versus the life we had before that. So we're going to take a moment. I want you to all stay in prayer. Or in thought. As Otis plays. And I will come down to the front. If you would come down. We would like to pray with you. We would like for you to acknowledge your decision. Of this moment in your life. Lord that, that we can celebrate with you. This moment, a moment that every Christian revels in when someone gives their life to Christ. We're going to play for a moment. If you have doubts, if you feel the urging of the Spirit, we would ask you to come forward and make that known to the world.
just fabulous. Yeah, just fabulous. Just so fabulous.